Distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Manila. And a very good evening if you are in Asia, good morning in Americas, and good afternoon in Europe and elsewhere. On behalf of the Asian Development Bank, it is my honor to welcome you to this 58th ADB Distinguished Speaker Lecture. Since 1982, ADB's Distinguished Speaker Program has allowed us to tap the expertise, knowledge, and current research of world-renowned scholars to better understand critical development issues, the current ones, as well as those we expect to face in the future. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Darren Echimoglu, Institute Professor in the Department of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. He received his Master of Science in Mathematical Economics and Econometrics and his PhD in Economics at the London School of Economics 30 years ago. He is an elected fellow of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, the Science Academy in Turkey, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Econometric Society, the European Economic Associations, and the Society of Labor Economists. He has received numerous awards and fellowships, far too many to mention here. Professor Aysimeklu never loses the forest from the trees. His research covers political economy, economic development and growth, human capital theory, growth theory, innovation, search theory, network economics, and learning. The institutional and political evolutions of nations was the theme of his best-selling book in 2012, Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty, co-authored with Professor James Robinson. The topic of today's lecture is automations, and the inappropriateness of technology. We will hear Professor Achimoksu fuse on what lies in store and how best to deal with automations and rapid technological advances that increasingly impact our labor markets. Some questions that will be tackled today include, what are the type of skills we need to prepare for the markets of the future? And what is our role at ADB as a development bank in ensuring that new technology benefits all the citizen of the Asia and the Pacific region. As I have mentioned before, technology and institution as, as forces of change are extremely important as we work our way into a pandemic recovery. Needless to say, new technology presents both opportunities and challenges. Across developing Asia and globally, the pandemic has really accelerated the use and application of digitalizations, AI, artificial intelligence, and eventually greater automations. On one hand, digitalization and AI are effective tools for developing countries to become more inclusive, bringing many more opportunities to many more people and small businesses to do things they could never do before. On the other hand, the technology and automation can also make workers redundant and concentrate economic power in the hands of a few corporate giants. How should we manage new technology so that they are indeed inclusive and benefit the greatest resource developing Asia has, its people. So our sessions today is most timely to discuss these fundamental questions. With that, let me welcome you all once again, and now give the floor to Professor Achimoglu. Over to you, Professor Achimoglu. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Bambang, and uh, you've summarized a lot of what I'm going to say, but hopefully people are still interested in uh, in me explaining it a little bit more detail. So I'm going to talk about automation and, oh, I should maximize this, sorry. Automation and inappropriateness of technology. And let me first start by saying thank you to this, for this invitation. It's a great honor to be joining all of you at the Asian Development Bank. And I'm sorry, I'm not there in person. At least I have an excuse that nobody is traveling right now. So <laughs> uh, it's not an unusual event for all of these things to be on Zoom. Automation is something that has become much more the main focus in many discussions of how shared prosperity will look like in the future and inequality in the developed world. So I think that part of my title does not need any explanation, but what do I mean by the inappropriateness of technology? Well, this is what we are building up to, but I'm going to argue 
that automation, far from being a mainly developed advanced economy challenge, is actually a looming challenge for developing nations, including those in Asia. But before I get there, let me try to explain where my thoughts about automation are coming from and what, at least according to my research, automation has done so far, both good and bad. So let's start in the US. Here, I'm showing a remarkable shift against labor in the US economy. In red, we have the so in, uh, in gray, we have the aggregate labor share, how much of national income goes to labor. And in red, we have the same thing, but with adjusting for industrial composition. In both cases, you see a very sharp decline in the labor share of about 10 percentage points. And it is something that's happening within industries, not just across industrial composition. Many theories have been advanced to explain this decline in the labor share, which is very rapid since 2000, but really starts somewhere around uh, the early 90s, late 1980s. Could be capital deepening, could be markups, could be monopsony. But I'm going to argue, in fact, it's much more connected to automation and we need to rethink some of the uh, ways we approach labor market prosperity, economic growth in the presence of automation. But before I get there, let me also argue, and I'll come back to this again, that automation has been a major cause of this pattern where we see a very significant, in fact, epochal increase in inequality in the US labor market. And again, same is going to be true in some other labor markets, but let me start with the US. What I'm showing in this chart is the evolution of the real weekly earnings of 10 demographic groups by gender and by education going all the way from the dark red for workers without any high school education, all the way to dark blue to workers with a postgraduate degree, such as MBA, uh, medical degree, or PhD. And what you see is that in the 1960s, and the same is true in the 1950s, you had a period of shared prosperity where the real wages of all 10 demographic groups were growing very much in tandem. More or less all 10 demographic groups are enjoying something above 2% real increase in earnings every year. But from around 1980, you see a very different pattern. While postgraduate workers are continuing to enjoy rapid earnings growth, this is not true for most other groups. And in fact, for low education men and some low education women, we have very sharp declines in real earnings, something that the US economy had not experienced since the Great Depression. And it's been going on for about three and a half decades. This is not just a US phenomenon. The very sharp decline in the wages of low education workers is not shared by many countries. You see a little bit of it in the UK, some of it in Germany, but the overall increase in inequality is true in most of the advanced economies. US started as the leader in inequality and has had one of the largest ones, but so did Japan, so did Germany, so did Sweden, Finland, Norway, even Norway, despite it's the very, very strong collective bargaining institutions. In fact, uh, you also see quite a lot of parallel <clears throat> in how the employment structure has changed throughout the Western industrialized nations. Most importantly, in almost all of them, occupations that used to be the bedrock of middle class aspirations and upward mobility, office work, back offices, uh, administrative work and blue collar employment, especially semi skilled blue collar employment, have been in decline in all of these economies. And in fact, here I'm showing you in the red with the red bar the share of employment that is in the middle third of the uh, uh, occupational distribution in terms of skills or wages. And you see that those are exactly the uh, occupations that are declining. 
What's common, of course, about these occupations is not just that they are all in the middle class, but they have also been the ones that have been at the crosshairs of automation, as I'm going to show you in a second. So if automation is going to be what we are going to talk about, one question is how to do that. The classic way in which economists think about <clears throat> all technologies is embedded in the standard production function approach. And I'm not going to do justice to it here, but suffice it to say that essentially at the root of this production function approach is that technology improves productivity, it shifts the production function up, and then ultimately it creates a productivity bandwagon where workers also benefit from it through increased labor demand. This has not always been completely welcome or accepted by all economists, including, for example, the great John Maynard Keynes in his famous 1929 lecture, uh, which then became the world for our grandchildren, he forecast about 2% growth in productivity, but he thought that this would not benefit workers and would create technological unemployment. Most economists in the intervening 80 years have dismissed Keynes's concerns, partly on empirical grounds, because that's not what happened, or at least until now, and partly on theoretical grounds, because actually the basic tools of the aggregate production functions, reduced form and black box, though it might be, <clears throat> did not really make sense of Keynes' statements. But in some sense, we need to revisit these issues. And the problem may not be with Keynes' statements, as many people came to believe, <coughs> but it might be with our conceptual framework. So to go a little bit deeper into this, I want to take a step back, abandon, at least temporarily, the aggregate production function, and instead think a little bit more about how production takes place. And for that, I'm going to start with this chart where on the horizontal axis, I have tasks. So what are tasks? Tasks are units of activities that need to be performed for production to take place. So if, for example, you are going to produce a piece of garment, you have a range of spinning tasks in order to produce yarn. You have a range of design tasks in order to come up with an idea of what garment you are producing, what it's going to look like, what its attractive features are going to be, then a set of weaving tasks in order to bring that yarn together according to that design, then a whole uh, host of chemical tasks, dyeing, drying, uh, chemical processing, and so on. And that finishes the production, but then you have a whole list of non-production tasks from wholesale, marketing, transport, uh, uh, retail, and so on, in order for that garment to, at the end, reach its destination. So uh, a key to the production process is then how to perform these tasks, in particular, whether they're going to be assigned to one factor of production or another. So here, let me start by simplifying things. And I'll talk a little bit about a deeper way of thinking about this in a second. But let me start by thinking of two factors of production, labor and capital. And other than that, I'm going to keep everything as close to the standard economic approach as possible. So these firms that have access to this production possibility are going to engage in profit maximization or cost minimization. So what matters is the cost of production of different tasks with these two factors. So here in blue, I'm showing the <coughs> cost of producing these tasks with labor. The shape doesn't matter, but it, I drew it this way. And it's of course going to be the wage that you have to pay to labor and their productivity in these tasks. And in red or orange actually, uh, I'm showing the cost of producing the tasks with capital. But there is a crucial assumption, I'll come back to this in a second, that we only know how to produce certain tasks with capital. There are many things that right now we cannot allocate to machines, including such lectures. Otherwise, you know, you wouldn't have me here, you would have a machine. So the key is going to be what is the feasible set of tasks to automate. Now, let's first think about 
the standard types of technological changes that are implicitly based, implicitly embedded in the more neoclassical approaches. And those would be the things, as I said, that increase productivity. So let's do one that increases labor productivity, for example. So if you increase labor productivity in this chart that corresponds to the cost of producing tasks with labor shifting down in a parallel fashion. You see that in this example, at least, that's not going to have a huge effect on the allocation of tasks because all of these tasks were already assigned to capital, which were the cheapest, cheaper factor for producing it. All of these tasks were assigned to labor. So this shift in Productivity is not going to affect things, but it's actually going to create a huge boon to both the firm and all its workers because productivity is increasing. So this is the essence of the more neoclassical approaches where the dominant impact of technological improvements is to increase productivity. The same would be true when you increase the productivity of capital. However, none of this really captures what goes on with automation. So when the famous weaving frames came and replaced skilled artisans in the first decade of the 19th century in Britain as one of the iconic events of the British Industrial Revolution, the reason why people uh, became Luddites and started breaking those frames was not because they didn't like the productivity effect, but because they were actually replaced and displaced from the tasks they used to perform. And many of these highly skilled, high paid, highly paid weavers found themselves unemployed or at the risk of unemployment. So in this framework, we can capture that in a simple way. It corresponds to the threshold for automation shifting to the right so that more tasks are now performable by capital or more generally by algorithms and machines. Now you see a very different set of implications from this type of technological change. First, you see something very new. You have a displacement of all of these workers that used to perform the tasks that have just been automated. Now they are no longer required for those tasks. They don't need to become unemployed. They may be reassigned to these tasks or the firm may stop hiring workers, etc. But at the end, there is a displacement of labor. That is the critical aspect of automation that's really missing in a lot of the basic economic approaches, it is now discussed in the popular press, but to understand its implications in full, we really need to focus on this displacement. But there's another important point to note, which is that as any technological improvement, there is the possibility of, at least the possibility in most or many cases in reality, of productivity gains, because now automation is enabling cheaper capital to be substituted for more expensive labor. The orange curve is below the blue curve, so the capital is cheaper. So that creates a productivity effect. But critically, as compared to this one, for example, where this was a huge productivity effect, now we have a little triangle here. How little is this triangle? Perhaps it's not that little, perhaps it's little. It's gonna depend on what type of automation technologies we're looking into and how expensive labor was to start with and a variety of other factors and I'll come back to. Now, of course, the proof of the pudding is the eating. For this perspective to be more useful, it needs to capture something both conceptually and empirically. I have argued that conceptually, the task approach captures a number of economic forces that are absent or at the very least hidden in the neoclassical one. But empirically, if at the end of the day, we have these automation technology and all that, all you get is this productivity increase and other things are second order, well, perhaps this approach more complicated, perhaps in some ways is not going to be all that useful. So let's then look at some technologies that look like automation technologies and make sure that we choose ones that are not trivial ones so that we at least have a chance of this green uh, 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 <clears throat> green productivity effect to be present. So one great example for that is robots. Robots have been absolutely epochal in many heavy manufacturing industries. From the US to South Korea and Germany, the auto industry throughout the Western world, the metal industry, electronics industry would not be the same without robots 
over the last 25 years or so. And productivity effects of robots, according to our estimates and other people's estimates, have been quite positive. So if indeed we have a sort of something that looks like the productivity bandwagon that everybody can jump on and everybody can benefit, this productivity increasing new machines should also bring benefits to workers in terms of employment and wages. To test that in uh, work with Pascual Restrepo, we look across US local labor markets, commuting zones, and we distinguish them according to their exposure to robots, meaning how much they are being impacted by robots. So across 722 commuting zones, we construct how much technologically robots have penetrated different industries and what is the baseline industry share of these industries in the relevant commuting zone. So in particular, we construct a measure we call the average penetration of robots based on the frontier of robotics. So it's not about the US investments, but the frontier of robotics technology. And here is a summary of those results. All I will say other than the summary is that what I'm showing you are extremely robust patterns. So it's not really a, a sort of, I'm not picking and choosing. It's a really remarkable pattern of very negative effects from robots. So in places that are more exposed to robots, which turns out to be exactly the ones which have, the, which have adopted the robots, you have significant declines in employment. This is showcased, but not confined to, by the industrial heartland of the United States, Detroit, Lansing City, Mount Pleasant, Defiance City, Wilmington, Lorraine. These are all the heavy industry capitals of the United States then you see that they have the ones, they are the ones indeed that have adopted the most robots and they are the ones where employment as measured by employment to population ratio, but other measures show the same thing, have declined most. But if you get rid of these places, so you limit it to this just this cloud of points, you get exactly the same slope of the line. The dashed line is without these points and the solid line is with the points. So there is a general and fairly steady relationship between more robots and lower employment. But what about workers in general who keep their jobs? Well, there the relationship is even more striking. You get, again, a very robust and a very powerful negative impact that real wages have declined, or at least have not kept up with the increases in the rest of the country in places where robots have been adopted most often. The burden of robots or more generally automation have not been equally distributed across different education groups. In terms of employment and wages, the more educated groups have not been negatively affected. It's the middle skill groups that have been most affected. Or here is a different way of seeing it. Uh, rather than looking at by education group here, Pasquale and I are looking at uh, the wage distribution by quantiles. And what you can see is that you have negative effects all the way through 50th, 60th percentile, and then it turns slightly positive, but zero. So essentially it's the bottom and the middle of the distribution that gets most impacted when robots are introduced. But we shouldn't put too much emphasis on robots. Robots are a very specific technology. They have spread rapidly in the US. But they're a very specific technology that impacts blue collar workers. So if you're a worker in a back office, if you're a worker who's doing knitting, if you're a worker who's doing construction work, you're not affected by robots. Perhaps 5% of the US labor force at most could be affected by robots. It's probably a little bit less than that. But automation is much broader than that. When I showed you that chart, across countries, really what's driving that is a lot of the middle-class jobs in white-collar occupations. So in more recent work, Pasquale and I adopt a different strategy to look at the effects of all types of automation technologies. And while this figure here looks at what's going on across commuting zones, so it's comparing, say, Defiance City, which had a very similar 
uh, level of income and other things to another city, which did not get affected by robots. Here, what we do more broadly is we shift the focus to demographic groups. So what we do is we create a data set in the US of 500 demographic groups distinguished by race, gender, uh, <clears throat> education, age, and also whether a person is immigrant or native born. And then we look at how these workers used to, what, to use these, what types of tasks these workers used to specialize in, what occupations and what industries. And then we look specifically at whether software-based automation, automation, equipment-based automation and robots have replaced tasks in those occupations. So when we do that, and here is a summary of the findings, these are each one of those dots is one of these 500 demographic groups. The color or the shape code, again, captures postgraduate, full college, some college, high school degree, and less than high school demographic groups. But now there are many of those. For example, there are many squares here for less than high school because, uh, <clears throat> because uh, there are differences by gender, by age group, etc. And and on the horizontal axis is how, what the fraction of tasks performed by these groups that have been automated. And here you see a really remarkable pattern that if you were working, if you were specializing in tasks that in 1980 that were later automated as a demographic group, then you are most likely experiencing fairly negative real wage changes. And uh, those groups like those diamonds and triangles college and post-college that are less affected by automation are enjoying real wage gains. And this is true across education groups and also true within education groups. And about in some 50 to 70% of all of the changes in the US wage structure between 1980 and 2016 seems to be accounted for by automation, about 10% of it by offshoring, about 90% of it by actual machinery automation. So the question is, if this is the case, then how come wage distributions have been so stable, labor share wasn't declining before? In fact, if there is so much automation, or at least automation is so important, as I have argued for both inequality and for the labor share, why is it that it was not showing its effects and made economists conclude that Keynes was wrong? Well, the reason is because, again, we have to think about tasks, but in a richer way. And when you think about the task structure of production, you are not just automating work, but at the same time, you are creating new tasks for workers. And it is this race between new tasks and automation that's really need to be taken into account, both for the labor share, employment creation, and inequality. And going back to the uh, theoretical framework, here is the same thing with tasks on the horizontal axis. But now what you can think about is adding new tasks here, which are essentially those in which labor can specialize in, and it reinstates labor into the production process. So in yet another paper, what Pascual Restrepo and I do is to say, well, what happened in the decades after World War II that kept inequality and the labor share fairly stable? And the answer turns out to be that there was, in fact, quite a lot of displacement due to automation, but it was counterbalanced by reinstatement generated by new tasks or new technologies that were helping labor. That was true both in the entire economy and in manufacturing. And you can see that from the fact that both of this one is going down, hurting labor. This one is going up, uh, helping labor. And the sum of the two, which is the yellow curve in the middle, is hovering around zero. Now, displacement is hurting labor, but it's actually not necessarily bad for the economy because it's creating productivity gains. But if we didn't do the reinstatement, then those productivity gains would be very unequally distributed. But somehow, for some reasons, I'll come back to this in a second, for 40 years, that was those two were fairly balanced. But let's now look at the more recent period. 
What you see is that the red curve is now going down more rapidly. There's an acceleration in automation, but the blue curve is now also slowed down so that the sum of the two is now going fairly negative. And in fact, this explains a lot of the labor share decline that I showed you. In manufacturing, it's even sharper. The blue curve is almost flat. So summary, it's not that automation per se is bad, but what we are experiencing over the last 30 years, a lot of automation and no counterbalancing or no other technological changes. Now, again, some people might say, well, I really care about efficiency and output. I don't care about what labor gets. If you are worried about distribution, then perhaps you should just use fiscal tools to do it. There are also problems with that perspective, even though many economists still subscribe to it. But I think there is a deeper problem. In fact, there are many reasons why, in fact, there could be a double whammy that automation may not even increase productivity. I don't have time to get into all the details, but both because of labor market imperfections, which make firms take into account wages when deciding whether to automate while from a welfare point of view, wages are above, mar above the opportunity cost of labor, so you shouldn't do that. From lots of other social externalities, there are reasons for worrying about firms automating excessively. And what happens when firms automate excessively? Well, you get this green triangle, which was a productivity gain. But if the firms go all the way to here to automate, you also get this red triangle, which is a negative. It actually subtracts from total factor productivity. And the red triangle could be as large as the green triangle, or it could be larger. So we could have efficiency reducing excessive automation. Why would that be the case? Well, there are many reasons. American and Western firms went into overdrive, into cost cutting because of global competition. At around the same time, the business models and the growing size of big tape became dominant in these economies. And all of these are all companies from Facebook to Google to Microsoft that made their business model based on algorithmic automation. Labor market institutions changed, reducing countervailing powers that could have slowed down or changed the direction of automation. But also government policies during this period became increasingly implicitly, perhaps unwittingly, more supportive of automation. So this is from a chart from work by myself, Andrea Manera, a graduate student at MIT, and Pasquale Restrepo. And what we show is that the marginal tax rate on, on equipment and software used for automation is much, much lower than the one for labor, and especially has become such lower over the last 20 years Today, the a firm that automates pays about 5% tax, but if it hires labor, it, takes, it pays over 25% tax. So that creates a huge wedge that encourages firms at the margin to use more machinery than labor, sort of exacerbating this <clears throat> automation trend. It will be one other reason to go beyond this point of intersection into the red triangle. <clears throat> well, so far, I talked about automation, and I've taken a little bit longer than I originally intended to. But I think I have built a case about how automation works. So where does the inappropriate of technology come? Well, for those of you who went to uh, school like me, in the 1980s or 1990s, or perhaps who read some of the debates from the 1970s, even if you are not that old, you may have come across a debate on inappropriate or appropriate technologies. Several economists at the time were worried, especially in agriculture, that the technologies that were being developed in the West were not the ones that would be most useful for the developing world. For one, <coughs> they may be going after hybrid varieties or pathogens that were not relevant for the developing world. 
that was one of the impetus for the huge research program that ultimately led to Green Revolution, extremely successfully, where Philippines, India, Brazil, Mexico were all participants. But also because it was capital intensive. Many developing economies, even more at the time than today, <clears throat> were scarce in capital, and capital intensive agricultural production technologies may not be the right ones. Same is true outside of agriculture as well. But in some sense, there is a possibility or a perspective that automation, especially AI-based automation, which is going to go more and more into new occupations, is the mother of all inappropriate technologies. All of the driver for automation is to cut labor costs by displacing labor from the tasks that it used to perform. And AI is trying to expand the reach of this by finding new tasks that humans used to perform that now algorithms can take over. But if you look at it from this perspective, what that means is that this is exactly the wrong type of technology for the developing world. The developing world has its most important resource in humans. It's rich in humans. Human skills are diverse in the developing world, and they are going to be the basis of their future growth. There is no example of developing countries over the last 50 years that have not started a rapid growth without using their human resources better. But if the world technology moves more and more in an automation direction, that's going to create a lot of problems for the developing world. In particular, work that I did with Fabrizio Zilimotti more than 20 years ago pointed out that inappropriate technologies would both increase inequality between the North and the South and inequality within the South because some countries can adapt to these more capital intensive or in this case, more algorithm intensive industries and others cannot. But the problem is that those suffering from excessive automation, 6 billion people outside of the Western world have essentially no voice on the direction of technology and future of work. But in fact, when you go one step further, you'll realize that even the another billion and a half people who are in the, the Western world who are directly impacted by them even more so or have been have started being impacted more rapidly because their jobs are more directly automated at the moment, they also don't have much of a voice. So in some sense, you could push this analogy and you can say actually AI based automation as well as automation in general, when it's done as the predominant type of technological change without the counterbalancing changes that I pointed out would be inappropriate even for the Western workers. So there is a bit of an issue. But of course, when I first started articulating these ideas, at least to myself and to people, the first line of reaction that you get from people, well, we don't have an alternative. This is the path of technology. This is where the new technology will have to go, if, even if it creates some disruption code word of Silicon Valley for misery of on others, well, we'll have to deal with it. But in fact, that turns out to be not true. There are many different ways of using new technologies, and that's exactly what my chart from the 1950s, 60s, 70s showed, that you can actually do much more human-friendly things, new tasks, etc. And in fact, this is doubly true for AI. To illustrate it, I could give you several examples, but let me just zero in on one, education. More than 40 years ago, Isaac Asimov uh, put his finger on what's wrong with our education system. He said, today, what people call learning is forced on you. Everyone is forced to learn the same thing on the same day at the same speed in the same class. But this was not a very ineffective model of learning. And Asimov said, we need individualized learning. But he was right. But at the time he was working, he was writing, this was completely impossible. The, 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 no country in the world had the resources, technological or human resources, to have individualized teaching 40 years ago. But today we do. And we do because precisely because there are many fewer jobs for middle skill workers, so we can hire more teachers, but more importantly, because we can use AI in an adaptive way in order to complement teachers to do much more individualized teaching. But is that the type of technology that people are pouring billions into developing? No. Uh, uh, absolutely a huge amount of money goes into AI research, but almost nothing goes into technologies like this. 
Why is that? Well, first of all, priorities are different. There's a huge demand from the Chinese government, for example, uh, for facial recognition technologies and other monitoring technologies, a huge demand from Facebook, Google, and companies like that for AI, for tracking individuals so that you can do uh, ad-based monetization and huge demand for algorithms, uh, sorry, algorithmic automation. In fact, of course, the bigger problem is that these sorts of ideas have now permeated the AI research field completely. If you look at talk to AI researchers, they wouldn't find this problem very interesting. The ideology of AI research has become such that what's cool is reaching human parity. What you want to do is you want to show your skills as an re AI researcher by creating new algorithms that are better than humans in certain things, chess, go, uh, facial recognition, recognizing huskies or whatever it is. If you don't work on problems like this, you're not viewed as a leading AI researcher. So the whole field has internalized these automation-based values. But of course, change is possible. And I'll conclude by talking very briefly about a case of success, as well as how it was achieved and some of the political aspects of it. One case in which such change happened is in energy. We have a terrible climate change problem. I don't want to minimize it. But in fact, in the background, there was some important success. And that success came from the fact that there was a huge amount of improvements in clean energy. 30, 25 years ago, solar energy was about 10 times as expensive as fossil fuel-based energy. Today, it's actually cheaper. And if the subsidies to big oil that uh, reach about $5 billion around the world are are removed for uh, renewable energy is actually much cheaper than fossil fuel based energy. How did this happen? Well, a lot of it happened because there was a redirection of technological change with some subsidies, with some regulations and a lot of societal pressure. And the societal pressure is really important. You know, the reason why many companies such as Exxon, Chevron, etc., today are reiterating their commitment to a clean climate is because they are feeling under huge amount of pressure. A lot of what they say is, of course, you know, not truthful, but still the fact that they are feeling compelled to say it is really a good testament to the amount of societal pressure. And in fact, the key here is regulation of technology. This is another area where human, uh, where uh, where economists, you know, I think need to reconsider their thinking. I certainly have. Uh, you know, in a lot of my work, I had previously seen many examples of autocrats and dictators blocking technological change. And that, of course, makes you really want to go to the more market-based solution to the technology. And I think there is a lot of truth to that. But on the other hand, when you are faced with things like fossil fuels or AI that's replacing work and creating huge inequalities, you really have to think about regulation of technology. How can we redirect technological change, which is a regulation question. And then the final thing I want to talk about is that none of this is easy. It has a political dimension. As I said, mobilization, mobilization of society, pro pressure on oil companies, energy companies, car producers was critical in a modicum of redirection of technological change. So we really need to think about the whole broader political direction. And in that case, the ideas that this gentleman, Frederick Hayek, uh, suggested are very important to take into account. He reacted to the blueprints for a welfare state in Europe that came in the form of the beverage report in the middle of World War II by saying that this will be a road to serfdom. It will open the way to uh, to, to a new totalitarianism because the state was becoming very strong and it would be the end of liberty. Actually, this is the topic that Jim, and I, Jim Robinson and I tackle in our more recent book, The Narrow Corridor, and I won't get into the main ideas, but there's a sense in which Hayek was right to worry about liberty, but there's a sense in which he was wrong, and the reason why he was wrong, and I think that's where I'm going to end, is that he did not take into account that there are responsibilities that the state will have to shoulder. And when that happens, the only option is not for society to buckle down and disappear under the weight of the 
administrative power of the state as he feared, but society itself can get stronger and it can get stronger by becoming more active, politically more powerful, better organized, better monitoring. Of course, there is no guarantee that this can happen, but this is exactly what took place in the decades that followed World War II in conjunction with new welfare state institutions. This is what we call the Red Queen effect in the book. And I think today, if we need to think about what the future looks like, I think it is much brighter if this type of new democratic institutions can also be developed. And of course, I'm aware that some of the AI type technologies have also fundamentally damaged some aspects of free press and free political exchange. So there are new challenges, but I think there are also reasons to think that new organizations and new ways of dealing with technology as well as new political channels are possible. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've run off over a little bit, but I'm looking forward to the comments by Albert and Sinyang. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Darren Asimoglu, for a thought-provoking lecture on the topic, automation and the inappropriateness of technology. Uh, my name is Madhavi Pandit, and I will be moderating the discussions and question answer session. We will first start with a set of comments for which we have invited today uh, Albert Park, ADB's Chief Economist and Director General of the Economics Research and Regional Cooperation Department, and Sin Young Park, Director of the Regional Cooperation and Integration Division. Uh, they will provide their reflections on the interesting ideas mooted by Darren, particularly in the context of ADB's member countries. Uh, before we move to the commenters, I would like to mention to our audience that uh, for the question answer session, you can include your questions in the Q&A box or hit like on questions that others have asked, and we will get to as many as possible during the allotted time. I can see that the Q&A box is already tingling. But let me first begin with our chief economist, Albert. As an accomplished economist yourself and the person spearheading ADB's research agenda, what are your thoughts on some of the insights of Professor uh, Asimoglu's recent research? Over to you, Albert. Uh, thank you, Maravi. Yeah, as usual, there's so much in uh, Darren's presentation that was very thought-provoking and stimulating. So let me just uh, pick a few um, issues uh, to maybe ask Darren to elaborate on or respond to. The first is, uh, you know, a few years ago, the Asian Development Bank Research Department produced an outlook report with a very long thematic chapter about on technology and jobs. And some of the analysis in that chapter suggested that the negative impacts of robots and automation in Asia was less, or in developing countries in particular, was less than in more advanced countries. And so I'm wondering whether that makes sense to you, Darren, um, and how you would interpret that. But, you know, the report suggests that, you know, part of the reason is that in, uh, in countries where wages are low and there's more unskilled labor, it actually turns it out, out to be the more capital intensive manufacturing sectors that adopt robots. So, you know, labor intensive sectors like uh, textiles and whatnot, it's just too cheap to use labor. They're not gonna automate very quickly. And so that maybe accounts for it. And also in many, as you know, Asia is a very dynamic part of the world. So growth has tended to be more robust and employment has, unemployment has tended to be less of an issue. There's been ro more robust labor demand. That's certainly the case in China, where even as robots have been widely adopted, we haven't seen a, a lot of unemployment. And in fact, we haven't even seen a dramatic increase in uh, wage inequality because it's coincided with a period um, where uh, unskilled labor has become increasingly scarce and um, the availability and demand for uh, more skilled workers has increased. Um, so that's the, that's the first uh, comment. Is this really an issue we should be worrying about uh, in Asia now, given, given uh, these findings? Or do you think it's imminent or is just something that's uh, down the road? The second um, question I would raise is, um, how would you answer, I think of many policymakers in, in Asian countries, they're, they're very much developmental states, they want to grow the economy and they view kind of improving, going up the value chain and adopting more technology intensive, uh, information technology intensive types of production processes and going into those sectors as a path to growth. And so 
of course, you can say you don't want to adopt a certain type of automated technology that's displacing, but they don't really connect that very clearly. They just think this is more advanced. And they feel that there's so many spillovers to moving up the value chain. And you know, some of the spillovers work through supply chains, but some could be through, you know, through competitors, through management skills, through uh, even increasing the incentive for workers to invest in human capital. So you could view this as just a good thing for overall growth uh, in the intermediate term, especially when you're starting from a point of low technology. So how do you, how would you answer these kind of policymakers who say you want us not to automate or you say it's okay to have technological change, but most technological change seems to be pretty strongly correlated with technologies that are complementary to skilled workers and tend to be less complementary to unskilled workers. Won't we just be stuck in very simple types of, um, I know that's not what you think, but it's a hard kind of question to answer. And then finally, um, I was, wanted to press you a little bit harder about thinking about the policy responses. So the, the, the comments you make about getting prices right and not distorting factor prices, that seems very obvious and compelling that you shouldn't distort the factor prices. But once you've done that, um, you seem, so, you know, of course the government can play a role and I think you're suggesting it should play a very a leading role, but how should we think about the market? Because you seem to argue that um, the market has values related to them and not, if they had no values, but they were just trying to maximize profits, it seems to me that they would be wanting to adopt both labor saving technology or labor cost saving technology, but they would also be wanting to uh, produce things uh, that created new jobs and how that balanced out. It's not so obvious, right? Whether that would be good and bad, especially since we maybe haven't even observed it if factor prices are, are systematically distorted in, in the way you think. Um, so for, for leading the market, should we, it seems like a hard job to incentivize uh, a company that's profit maximizing to do more of this or less of this, it seems like you would have to know quite a lot about the technology itself to even think about designing an incentive beyond getting the factor prices factor price right. So I'm just curious if you really felt there were things that could still be done. And then the last thing I question I had was about artificial intelligence. I know you have you you started talking about AI, and I know you have another paper um, forthcoming that uh, looks at AI. And I think the conclusion of that is there is not yet an obvious negative effect on employment the same way as robots. And so I'm, I'm curious about how you think about the difference between AI and robots from a theoretical standpoint. Um, and, and does that make you feel more optimistic about what AI is going to do, despite the comments and warnings that you gave at the end of the talk? Thank you very much. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Albert. Uh, why don't I turn the floor back to Darren uh, so that you okay. could briefly All right. respond? Yes, yes. Well, these, these are Albert. excellent comments. So it's a thank you. Uh, thank you, Madhavi. Uh, these are all excellent, excellent comments, Albert. And uh, I could talk about half an hour about each of them. So that would put us in two hours. So that's probably not ideal. But so let me try to be a little bit briefer. So, uh, <clears throat> You know, you're absolutely right. You know, everything I'm, I'm talking about is recent research, so our conclusions can change, but they're at least based on quite a bit of data. But the impacts of automation on the developing world, we have much less solid evidence. Now, there are three pieces of evidence here that are relevant. But before I mention those, uh, those, uh, the, the, that evidence, it's useful to distinguish between the impact that automation technologies will have on the developing world directly and indirectly. Directly would be when robots or other automation technologies are adopted in the developing world. Indirectly is because they change the global distribution of the, the global division of labor. So I think uh, the second one may be the 
channel that the developing world should be most worried about, that tasks and jobs that would have otherwise come to the developing world may no longer do so because they are now doing, being done in other countries by a combination of robots, AI algorithms, software, and so on. So in fact, there, we already have some evidence that that's exactly what's happened when robots were adopted in the car industry in the US that many of the jobs that used to go to Mexico ceased to doing so. So taking those into account, I think uh, the question is, you know, there is a pattern of what Danny Roderick calls the premature deindustrialization that affects Asia less than Latin America and Africa. But is that because of the first phase of automation or not? We don't have direct evidence, but that's certainly one likely uh, likely outcome. In terms of where robots are going to, where automation is going to have its impact, actually, you're 100% right, uh, Albert. Even in the US, it's not textiles or apparel or shoes, uh, furniture, etc., but it's the heavy industries where you see the robots have much of an effect. Now, there are other automation technologies that have impacted to some extent textiles, but their effects have been much less than, say, for example, offshoring of jobs in the textile industry. So in the same sense, you expect uh, a lot of the automation to be impacting more of the non-manufacturing industries and the heavy industries in the developing world. And I think we are very much at the beginning of it. So I'm not sure whether this is going to be a important trend that nevertheless won't affect many Asian economies, or it will really have more pervasive effects as we are seeing in some of the more uh, closer Latin American countries like Mexico, for example. In terms of your second point, yes, you're absolutely right. I think that's the key question is if indeed these concerns are valid, then grow the economy is not going to be just the right objective. But I think it requires a bigger mindset, something I wanted to say, but I didn't have time. If indeed these, uh, these considerations are important, what they require is that the developing world via international organizations such as the UN or ADB, but again, Asia may or may not be the front line here, so I don't know, but really try to have inputs into the direction of research in the developed economies. So if we take the following two points as axiomatic, A, frontier technologies are going to be developed in the advanced nations, and B, they are going to go more and more in the automation direction, then the policy conundrum that you pointed out, well, how can we grow if we don't go more into automation becomes a reality. But neither of these two things should be taken for granted. The Green Revolution shows that you know, the developing world could have more of a leading role in developing new technologies, and perhaps both international and national pressures can change the direction of research. And that brings me to your third comment, which is very, very important. You know, where does the market stop? Well, that's a fundamental question. It's, uh, and it's again, one where not all economists can be convinced of what I'm saying, but I, I would draw three layers and you were absolutely right in zeroing in on three of them. The first is if indeed there are distortions created by policy, such as the tax policy that I pointed out, then I think even the most market-friendly people might agree that you know, some policy reforms are necessary. Okay, the details may be some people might think actually for other reasons that capital taxes should be small, et cetera, but we can get into that. But if indeed I'm right that there is a distortion there favoring capital, sure, that's a problem. But second, suppose we've solved those but think of the fossil fuel problem. So the fossil fuel problem was not created by distorted prices, although those played a role because you know, for the last 80 years, governments have given, handed billions of dollars every year to the, to the oil sector and the coal sector. But even if you remove those, the market won't function very well because 
some activities, such as burning fossil fuels, create massive externalities, and others, such as renewable technology, do not. So the market's not going to get that right, so we need to interfere. And we need to interfere with a combination. Again, I didn't get into it, but my research here shares, says I have uh, some papers on this area. What says it's not enough to use a carbon tax. You need to do it both through uh, subsidies to the direction of technological change and carbon taxes. So if indeed automation is creating negative externalities via the channels that I pointed out, for example, because there are labor market imperfections or distributional ones against, there would be reasons to interfere. But in fact, I also went further and I hinted at, and you zeroed in on it completely correctly. I'm actually not fully convinced that for new technologies such as AI, for which there's a lot of hype, that businesses are necessarily profit maximizing. You know, there are millions of businesses around the world that don't understand AI. All they know is what a bunch of people who claim to be very smart and very knowledgeable tell them about what they should do with AI and how they should use AI, what AI technologies are, there are. So I think there is no guarantee that the market mechanism will work very well when there is so much hype. I don't think that's a justification for central planning by any stretch of imagination or very tight regulations, but I think we have to at least watch out and also perhaps encourage diverse research approaches and diverse perspectives because otherwise this sort of hype pushing us all in the same direction. So if the truth is that actually we should be using AI for creating new products and AI-based automation is both inefficient and not so good for many companies, but still millions of companies can go in that direction if there isn't this diversity and this countervailing push against it. And that's exactly where my answer to your last question comes in as well. AI actually is very different from robots precisely because AI is a broad, broad platform for developing new technologies. I think you know, there are many details for robots, but there's a very clear way of using robots. From the get-go, they were ways of automating basic, uh, regular, repetitive physical activities by machines. AI, you can use them for many different ways. You can use them for the educational vision that Asimov had. You can use for automated testing and replacing teachers. Which one? So I think that's where the hype and the vision and all of these things matter a lot. And that's where actually redirecting technological change becomes particularly important. Excellent follow-ups, Darren. Let me uh, now invite Sin Young for a second set of comments, including perspectives from ADB's own work. Sin Young, over to you. Thanks, Madhavi. Um, Thank you, Professor Smolo, for very, for very um, interesting and provocative presentation. Um, in, in fact, the earlier, um, some of our research was also a bit uh, inspired by uh, your uh, thesis that the uh, you know, technology uh, path is not uh, preordained uh, you know, in a way that uh, it can be directed to support the uh, human productivity. Uh, one of the uh, uh, recent research, uh, just about two years ago, one of our um, you know, publication, the Asia Economic Integration Report, uh, in fact, uh, look at uh, that uh, role of technology to assist the uh, aging uh, population uh, in uh, developing Asia. Um, while many people do uh, uh, somehow picture that Asia is still very young <laughs> uh, and then dynamic, uh, many of Asian economies are aging fast and uh, their workers are also uh, rapidly aging. And uh, uh, our research uh, in, in a way that showed the um, you know, adoption of appropriate technology can actually mitigate the negative impact of uh, older workers. Uh, you know, one of uh, our the paper um, that I co-authored 
uh, also pointed like, you know, I mean, uh, since you already mentioned that uh, you've been to Korea and then uh, you also uh, know that uh, how uh, much automation has advanced uh, in, uh, in Korea, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that, that actually looked at the more specifically Korean case um, and, uh, you know, the uh, adoption of uh, robotic technology actually uh, reduces the negative uh, uh, impact of uh, the uh, you know older workers, and uh, it somehow like maintain the older workers' productivity and the contribution uh, to total factor productivity. Uh, so, um, in it actually also chimes with the uh, one of the results that uh, we had in the uh, in the. Uh, in, in, the, in that uh, Asia Economic Integration Report theme chapter, that the labor augment, there are different types of technology, of course. And then there's, uh, if we are, uh, uh, you know, like somehow uh, choosing the uh, labor augmenting technology versus labor substituting, then might uh, help uh, the maintain the productivity of uh, aging society. I, I'm, uh, I wonder like if this uh, actually aligns uh, with your finding and uh, if you feel that uh, there are uh, other, um, you know, the um, types of the technologies that are appropriate uh, to certain, uh, you know, economies with a certain changes in demographics. Um, my second question is that uh, you, you did also mention that the technology uh, impact on the wages and then employment uh, may be worsening the income distribution and inequality trends. Um, during the COVID, we have seen uh, the negative uh, distributive uh, effects of the technology driven uh, transformation in the businesses. Do you uh, see uh, the worsening trend of inequality, given that uh, there is uh, uh, more action and influence the labor market, and especially when the labor market uh, matching is a uh, We do to mitigate this uh, uh, negative uh, adverse impact on inequality. And uh, my uh, final question is, uh, in uh, your earlier work, uh, you also noted that, uh, you know, the political barriers to development. Uh, economists tend to under, uh, underline the growth is a very necessary uh, condition for poverty reduction and technological advances are among the key factors uh, for promoting growth. But you also mentioned that there are uh, uh, oftentimes a resist resistance of uh, political elites uh, against the certain institutions and the technology that could help promote the development. Uh, can you elaborate what type of the institutions and technologies uh, that will be, uh, you know, the, somehow playing as a barrier to development, and how can we reduce the, that type of uh, uh, the barriers? Thank you, Sin Young. Uh, if I may, let me uh, tag on a question from the chat box on aging that says that automation may to some extent be substituting for workers who are not there anymore. And how does that change the picture? Over to you, Darren. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much, Sin Yang. And uh, thank you very much, Madawi, and the question from the audience. And uh, uh, in, in fact, Sin Yang, I, I know some of your work on financial inclusion, but I didn't know about the work you guys did on, on, on demographics uh, apologies for that. But in fact, I, uh, I have a paper on this uh, exact question, which I did not have time to mention, but, but thank you for giving me an opportunity to sort of talk about that and in, in the context of answering your question. So indeed, you know, the way you can think about it is that there are two complementary drivers of automation. One is that technologies are changing autonomously, or they may be changing in some frontier and they may become available to your country. But second, that there is the induced channel precisely because of labor shortages. 
And what in uh, a paper that I wrote with Pascual Restrepo, we show is that a lot of the demand for robots, both from the developing countries and some developed economies, such as South Korea, Germany, and Japan, especially among them, is very linked to a shortage of middle-aged workers that used to be the ones that specialize in blue-collar manual tasks in all of these economies. And uh, how does that change the picture? Well, it changes them in three interrelated ways. One is that actually robots are not, and I never meant to imply it, is, are not a problem. problem. They are a useful technology, just depends on how you use them. How you use them is very country specific. So if you have the South Korea has become the fastest adopter of robots, precisely because they were the fastest aging economy from essentially a young economy in the course of about 35 years, they became one of the oldest economies uh, in the world. So that adjustment was quite well navigated by South Korea essentially by going into robots. But that's a very different dynamic than, say, for example, what the U.S. is facing, which is not it's aging, but much more slowly. So it's going to depend on what type of economy you're dealing with. And in fact, and in response to the question that the audience asked, when what our work shows is that when the main driver of automation is these labor shortage, the inequality implications of robots are also much mitigated. It doesn't mean that we don't need to do the other complementary things like productivity, uh, human, human productivity, enhancing technologies, new tasks, et cetera, but, but the problem is, 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 is becomes less severe. So in that context, you know, China, is China today automating because of demographic trends that they foresee in the future? There's gonna be very rapid aging or is China automating because of other reasons like what Albert was saying, because they feel that's the best way to grow. And then they have a lot of demand for AI, facial recognition, data collection, and so on. So it's, it's a complex thing. But, but I think, uh, uh, in my mind, automation is going to increase inequality trends quite a lot in China in the years to come. But, but, but absolutely, I think uh, the other way in which the demographic aspect is important is because it shows the two faces of automation much more carefully, much more clearly. So I, I call this in some presentation, the two faces of automation, because one of them is good. It actually solves problems, especially in an aging society. And we may see that in Japan more and more also in the service sector. But the bad face is that when it gets out of control and it's not counterbalanced by other technologies, it becomes a factor that increases inequality and reduces labor opportunities and may increase may create inappropriateness of technology in the developing world. And in terms of resistance to technology, and I think that's critical as well. So, you know, I, my view is exactly like you intuited, is that like most other economists, I think that growth is not a problem, it's part of the solution. There are rough, estimating it roughly, there are still about 5 billion people who are in poverty in the world if you choose poverty line in a relatively reasonable way. So economic growth is not a luxury. It's something we have to continue in order to lift you know, billions of people out of moderate poverty and some from out of abject poverty. But I think if we don't get the direction of technological change right, resistance to that growth is going to build up. I don't find it surprising that there is a very powerful degrowth movement. And I think both the business world and economics are to blame. The reason is because we did not correctly create the right framework and the right uh, policy advice to redirect technological change away from fossil fuels sufficiently. And then many people un not unreasonably concluded you're not going to be able to reduce fossil fuels unless you stop growth. So I think the biggest boost to degrowth has come from policymakers and the economics profession's inability to articulate that alternative vision. I fear exactly the same will happen if 
we do not redirect technological change away from pure automation and inequality creating technologies because now the growth is going to become identified with inequality boosting. But again, there is no need for it. And in fact, South Korean experience recently or the Western experience <clears throat> in the three and a half decades following World War II shows you can have the most rapid productivity and economic growth together with reductions in inequality. But if everybody concludes that technological change and new technologies are bound to bring inequality, I think resistance to growth becomes much stronger. Thank you, Darren. Um, so let me get to some questions from the audience. Um, there was a chart that you showed in the beginning of your presentation, and Jules has a question. Could the decline in the labor share starting in the 1990s also be linked to declining bargaining power by workers following the disintegration of the Soviet Union um, as somewhat an alternative development model? It's a great question, and indeed, yes. There are many factors that are potentially contributing to overall inequality as well as to the decline in the labor share. And I myself have some work as well showing that uh, <clears throat> there has been a decline in rent sharing, but quantitatively and timing wise, I think those appear more as secondary factors rather than the main drivers. So for instance, you know, our estimates suggest that the reduction in rent sharing perhaps explains one or two percentage points of that labor share decline, not more than that. And in terms of timing, you know, the big trend against rent sharing really starts much earlier because, you know, private sector unionism in the United States has been in decline since the 1960s and really accelerated in the early 1980s. So, so I think in terms of timing, it's not so clear, but it does not mean that it's not a factor. I certainly think it's a factor. I think the best way of seeing how to think about that is compare the US to other countries where unions are playing more of a role. So when you look at Germany, for example, where collective bargaining is still much more important, you see that Germany is affected by exactly the same trends. Inequality is increasing in Germany. There is a lot of automation, some of them indeed harming low skill workers. But on the other hand, you're also seeing that because of work councils, bargaining and other institutional features, German firms are doing much more to help the labor. So when robots are introduced in Germany, there's much more of an effort to reallocate workers to other jobs in the same firm, as opposed to in the US where they are laid off. So, so it shows that these bargaining institutions matter, but you really need to sort of consider them together with automation, in fact, which might be the more dominant form of the more dominant force in this context. Thank you. I have two questions here that are related to peculiarities of Asian economies. One is that there is um, a large bulk of migrant workers from several Asian economies to advanced and other countries in the world. So what would be the impact of automation for migration? That is one. And secondly, uh, do these concepts uh, apply mostly to manufacturing or is automation also related to the services sector? Great question. Uh, and they're both related in exactly like we've pointed out, Madawi. Uh, so uh, my work, as well as some discussions in the broader uh, popular press, puts a lot of emphasis on robots for a variety of reasons. Robots are visible, they're easy to see, they're easy to measure, we have the best data on robots. But in fact, you know, robots are really a very small part of the story because robots right now really apply in heavy industry and blue collar work. That's 
quite a bit less than 5% of the labor force in the U.S. right now. In some places like South Korea, it's bigger, but it's still a small minority of the overall workforce. But what we find is that automation more broadly is very important. In fact, as important as robots. And a lot of it takes place in many different forms, software-based automation, automation using databases, automation using new measurement methods, and so on and so forth. And those are taking place in services. So it's therefore very useful to separate robots and other forms of automation, but not right to think that robots are the most important aspect. So service sector automation is ongoing and will continue to be very central. Now, in terms of what this implies for Asian migrant labor, I am certainly not an expert, but it will depend on what types of economies we're talking about and what jobs we're talking about. So migrant workers that used to work in uh, not that many of them work, but th those who used to work in heavy industries, well, they're going to be affected by automation directly. Migrant workers who work in agriculture, that's a much bigger group. Right now, they're not that directly affected by automation, but actually agricultural automation, the next stage of agricultural automation is something that's receiving a lot of investment. So there are prototypical robots that do food picking, that do uh, much more of the uh, agricultural tasks than, than used to be done by harvesting machines and tractors until now. But the biggest area is service robots. So uh, a lot of workers from South Asia go to the Gulf. They're not going as there as agricultural workers or manufacturing workers, but they're going there as uh, to work in the household sector or the service economy. And, and I think it's not going to be relevant for the next 20 years that you're going to have machinery that can do most of the tasks that these workers are able to do. Uh, there will be perhaps robots that help with cleaning, et cetera, but it's not, it's going to be a special speciality items. So I don't think that is the sector that's going to bear the brunt of automation in the next two decades. And if you look at the US or Germany, that those are in fact the tasks that have been least automated uh, at the moment. But obviously other automation trends might change them. So if for example, automation in other sectors reduces the labor shortages in the United Arab Emirates, that might change their demand for migrant workers through a more general equilibrium effect that remains to be seen. Thank you for that. Uh, we have some questions on policies and regulations. So maybe you could address it in general. What should be some of the policy responses of governments, um, also regulations of, in sectors uh, where automation is increasing and for sections of the, and to support certain sections of the population? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to return to this issue. I think, <clears throat> Albert already outlined it the right way. <coughs> I would say it's hierarchy of regulations. First, get rid of the distortions that encourage excessive automation. That would be the equivalent of getting rid of subsidies to fossil fuel and, uh, and, and sort of leveling the playing field. But in many ways, I think that's not enough. It would be a very, very useful first step, but it's not enough. I think more broadly, you need a redirection of technological change. And I think the, way, the best way to do that would be via subsidies. Of course, we could go into more draconian measures and tax automation, et cetera, but I think that would be counterproductive in many ways. And in the case of renewable energy, even a small amount of subsidy went a very long way by focusing researchers, increasing the visibility of these new areas. So uh, it's a harder problem because you know, by the time governments started subsidizing renewable energy, there was a very good measurement framework. 
they knew what was clean energy and what was not. That wasn't known by the, in the 50s, for example, but it was known by the 1990s. So I think it needs to be coupled with a clear set of areas where uh, the government sets agendas for human-friendly AI technologies and human-friendly digital technologies, and then has a basic measurement framework so that it can actually prevent gaming of the system. And then the final one, I think, is not a explicit government policy that you can change the vision and the priority of companies, AI researchers, and how those, that whole field is going to go, but increasing diversity of voices would help. So it is for that reason that I think it's critical that the developing world becomes aware of these problems, becomes organized. Of course, I understand today uh, that we are not in the... Uh, in, in the peak of uh, global cooperation, but when if you have, you know, uh, major Latin American countries, India, Pakistan, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, all of them come together and say, you know, we worry about the future of technology, we want to have a voice in this, that does have an impact in terms of changing priorities, or at least putting pressure on global companies. So I think those are important steps that also need to be considered. Thank you, Darren. I think with this, we have reached the end of our scheduled time. Um, so let me um, thank you so much for your time, for your excellent thoughts. It was truly a rich and fruitful lecture and discussion. And we are left with many fascinating insights to ponder over, explore and apply in a developing country context. As VP Susantono said, we want to think carefully about technology and how it can benefit countries in our region and how ADB can be a partner in this cause. From the Asian Development Bank, I would like to thank Professor Darren Asimoglu for sharing his valuable time with us today. Thank you also to the audience for your active participation. If you enjoyed today's webinar, please join us again for the next Asian Impact Webinar for the launch of the Asian Economic Integration Report 2022 on February 9th at 10 a.m. Manila time via Zoom. Thank you for joining us and stay safe.